Western medicine is really, and I talk about this in my book, but Western medicine is really designed to create a cure, right? And the cure is for the symptoms. So if I have migraines, it'll make the migraine go away. If I have, you know, reflux, it'll make the reflux hopefully go away, but it's not gonna really get to the core or the root of like, why am I getting migraines? Or why do I have reflux or whatever it is, right? So trauma really is at the root and at the seat of so many things that we experience in our lives. The lens that we see ourselves in the world, how we actually react and act in the world and so on and so forth. So I found brain working recursive therapy much later on in my healing journey, as opposed to singular. All right, Sharon Land, welcome to the Soul Seeker podcast. I'm so stoked to have you here. You and I just recently met through my partner, Jamie McFadden, and we had a great first conversation. And now here we're going to unpack and get to know each other with a live, not necessarily live, but recorded podcast and y'all listening and learning from Sharon, hopefully have some wisdom too. With that, Sharon, welcome to the show. And uh, please let everyone know just a little bit about you since you do have an extensive background. I don't want to butcher any of it at all. (laughs) I know it's hard to, with all the acronyms, right? So Sam, it is so great to be here. And after our first conversation, I just thought, oh God, this is going to be such a great conversation that we have today. And I'm glad that we're recording it. So I'm Sharon Land. I am a licensed holistic psychotherapist in the state of New Jersey, but I was a born healer. And so really the last branch of the Evergreen so far was getting my license to practice clinical psychotherapy here in the state of New Jersey. I also do somatic therapy. I'm a spiritualist. I do something called brain working recursive therapy, which helps to heal the trauma in the brain and help to rewire and create new neuroclusters and neurons to be able to bring you a heal your original trauma and bring you up to what is more appropriate and more coherent for who you are today. So it's fantastic. It's one of the best trauma trauma therapies that I've actually been trained in. And there's been a lot. I also am a student of Dr. Levery and am trained in something called harmonium and some other healing techniques, which are all downloads through the universe to him. And then he has shared those with us and we practice those. And yeah, I mean, I also am an author a future bestseller and poet and a creative and a former professional equestrian and many, many, many other accomplishments along the way, being a, you know, a healer and also a former and recovering perfectionist. (laughs) We like to get a lot of those things, those buzzwords after our names. (laughs) Yeah, you have so much there. There's so many different things to unpack. And you know what I'm all about is this message of soul life balance rather than work life balance and recategorizing work as part of life. So having said that, like, yes, a lot of this outside, like the question and a few other things is business related. And you have such a huge heart and passion to help others in terms of yourself. Like what really fills you up these days? You know, that's a really, really great question. And that's one of the reasons why I was really attracted to coming and talking with you, because part of my journey has been to get off of the treadmill of yeah. keeping up with the Joneses. And really finding that true sense of who you are so that you can find where your balanced and full expression is out in the world. So who I am and what I do professionally is who I am and how I live personally. There's no difference between I... I'm sitting here in my living room and I, two minutes before we started recording, I'm exactly the same person as I am today. There's no mask. There's no putting on airs. There's just a very intentional presence and as well as regulation from my nervous system, which was not the way that I used to live at all. So it's a complete, it has been through my own labor of love and finding my own self-love and understanding who I truly was that has 
brought me to, you know, living a very intentional, very simple life. I love that. And self-love is so important. I don't believe that it gets talked about enough, especially like you would think, especially like in healing circles, self-love, 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 but it's, it's really not. And there's so many pressures and obligations and external narratives in spiritual and mindful and conscious mm-hmm. communities. And really, I, th- I think it all kind of boils down to self-love and that is what's most important. And recently in one of my groups, a conversation came up of like, but what does self-love actually mean? So I'd love yeah. to hear from you what self-love mm. means to you. Yeah. So I have these conversations a lot in, individually with my patients and clients, as well as with my friends and, and with cohorts. So I really truly believe. So let me just create a bit, a bit of a foundation and a platform. I believe that we are all connected to something bigger and greater than ourselves. So I call that God. I call that gods, goddesses, universe, source. I actually believe in multiple as opposed to singular. So knowing that, also knowing how absolutely magical that and those higher powers and higher essences are, I know that they're so infinitely wise that if they were just singular or they were only several, right, that that would be extinct and extinguished in a blink of an eye. But really in order for that beautiful magic and love to continue to live on and multiply, they must place that all within every single one of us. And so part of who I am in my own self-love journey is understanding who I truly am from a soul level, right? Coming into this physical form and then deconstructing all of the things that were in the way of me really honoring and understanding how absolutely magnificent I am and how unique I am yet at the same time, how basic and like just another link in the chain I am in the grand scheme of things. So I really believe the self-love journey is really about the deconstructing of all ideas of expectations of who we're supposed to be and really finding out that just right measure of what it is that we need so that we can be the best that we can be, so that we can be strong and a vessel and an instrument in the world, in the universe, in the multiverse, right? As we are very specifically placed here in this time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that's beautiful. And I resonate with all of that. And in terms of needs, that needs is a very tricky thing to navigate because, you know, it, it's very hard to know what we need. And I'm someone who says that as well. I'm like, you know, soul life balance is all about checking in with yourself and asking yourself like what I need in this moment, or how can I love myself in this moment a bit mm-hmm. more and honoring that. And most of us just have so much clouding that, but especially if we're going through it, you know, if someone listening is going through it and their mind's just racing and they cannot seem to think straight, how do you even get to finding out what it is that you need? Yeah. So I think that, that, that comes from taking your power back and coming back into your own center first. I was just having a conversation with someone and, and a new client, and this will maybe might be able to help to give a nice example to everyone that's listening now. We have this thing called epigenetics and we have, which basically means that our generational experiences and our generational expression, which includes deciding what we need and what we don't need and all of those things, come from seven generations and beyond back and will continue to express themselves from seven generations in front of us, right? So I was work, I'm working with this woman. She's actually like in her seventies. And we, she has had this experience of significant and severe anxiety, panic attacks, where she now she's barely able to, she's failing to thrive, right? She can't eat, work is hard and she just kind of keeps going. So, so she's, she's so open and which is so incredible. I said, gosh, if everybody could be like you, right. Just showing up and being present. And, and basically she said, I don't know what I need. I feel like maybe I just need tools. And I said, of course, tools are always great, but really what we need is to find 
out how we can be safe and comfortable with who we are in this moment. And so one of the things that I realized in our conversation yesterday was the fact that she has a list and a checklist and a to-do list of something for her to do all day long, all day long. And so I said to her, so where do you actually just have time to rest? Where time just to be? time to be by yourself. She said, oh, well, I, I watch television. And when I watch television, then I make sure that I have my cross stitch or I do my needle point or I'm doing a crossword puzzle and I'm doing, and there is this deep, deep programming inside of her that says, in order for you to be worthy, to even take up space, you need to be doing something. So I think that sometimes what happens in our minds and in our physical energetic patterning, that we have this drive, this metronome that makes us feel like we actually need to be doing and producing. And if we're not doing that, that we're actually not worthy of even taking up space. So I want to just challenge everybody who's listening to maybe just for a moment, be okay. Just a moment with taking a breath and taking just half of a seat back. Right. And then allowing whatever comes into your mind to be the thing that you need in that moment, right? So we don't normally, so where we find ourselves very distracted and where a lot of times there's, you know, so there's 25 things to do and there's only five minutes of time to do any of those things that we feel this ultimate pressure that we have to get all of the things done. And that's a lie. That's a complete lie. Because everything, the world's going to keep turning. You're going to be fine tomorrow. Everything's going to be fine. You're going to have your breath. You're going to have your heart. You're going to have your soul. And you're going to have a new chance to try something again the next day. And so part of that distractibility of not really knowing how to give ourselves what we need is this programming of consumeristic, like this thing over here is going to tell you what you need right? (laughs) You need to buy this Lamborghini. (laughs) Oh, you don't have the money for the Lamborghini? No problem. So then you need to work really hard to make the money to buy the Lamborghini. So then there's this kind of dis-ease all of the time. So the first thing to do to solve for ourselves is to realize that we, we need to commit to not suffer anymore and that we don't need to live in dis-ease anymore. And anything that you can do in just right measure to not be in that state of dis-ease is exactly what you need. A hundred percent. And thank you for all of that. There's so many excellent nuggets. I was sitting here writing timestamps to go back and <laughs> check it out later. But um, yeah, it's, uh, one thing that comes up for me is that this is still a, a very much challenge for people that are on this path. And then when they get worked up because there's a new life circumstance that maybe sends them in downward spiral of a a whole new iteration of a dark night of the soul or a little mini one, that it's almost so hard to access these tools that we've been working for our for years or even a lifetime, what's Mm. your recommendation there in terms of like knowing what you ought to be doing because you know what works for you, but then having the disconnect of being like, I just can't do it right now. And I, I can't sit with my thoughts or whatever it might be to actually surrender to that. Yeah. Well, I think that your, the, your word is perfect. It's surrender. Yeah. Right. And so I like tools. I really like tools. I, I think, you know, for instance, there are all these things that, you know, we can break glass in case we need it, you know? So we have things like emergency medicine. We have things like, you know, if you're having a panic attack, how to bring yourself down and ground yourself and all of that. Right. And those are all super necessary. However, I think that we, again, that's, we, we really need to get into the idea of that we need to be in a practice and that there's a ritual and there's a practice that is just right for you and yourself and your soul that you start to implement small, tiny, measurable steps every day so that you're prepared for when things do go awry because life does get life in, right? So we all, we were just talking about that before we pressed record, right? So 
life really does get life in. And so we, we, I think that many times we have this expectation that if we do X, Y, and Z, so for instance, maybe if we're, what we're trying to solve is anxiety and that's a very common thing right now. Okay. Everybody on some level, there are new forms of anxiety that have manifested themselves from the pandemic. For instance, I am dealing with families who now have this, you know, there's no clinical diagnosis, but I'm noticing that there is this like cross, you know, like trauma bond anxiety kind of thing that is, it's growing. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if we're, if we're talking about, you know, helping to solve for anxiety, you know, the best way to be able to deal with that anxiety is to realize that we are a body and a mind and a spirit and that we must be helping to be with, sit with, attend to, and nourish all of those aspects of self. And what tends to happen, especially with anxiety, is we're very future projected. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to control something so that we can help to mitigate any kind of pain, right? Because we're, we're, we're just afraid of pain, right? And that's just, that's just kind of the way I, I, I try to not be afraid of pain, but you know, I just was at the gym this morning, working out with my trainer. And I was like, I hit this threshold and I was like, I'm a little, I'm a little scared right now. You know, <laughs> you know we're all, it's just naturally instinctive. And it's, I think that's why discomfort is so powerful because it's right before the threshold of pain, you know, and pain is, gets the point of being unsafe. I mean, speaking from a gym point of view, obviously processing trauma and sitting with the discomfort, it goes so much deeper than just discomfort. Yeah. It's, it's, it's really painful depending on what you're working through. So, so that's an interesting yeah. iteration or distinction there. Yeah. So there is definitely a distinction between, and, and so our brains, and so speaking about trauma, which is like one of my most favorite things to talk about in the whole entire world is that if there's, there's this thing that happens to our brains when we've experienced trauma. And I really don't know anyone at this point who exists on this earth that has not experienced some level of trauma, but what happens when we experience unrepaired trauma is that it it actually starts to reside. There's a physical marker in our brains, as well as like an energetic marker in our cells, as well as like an emotional reaction in our whole body and our mind and our spirit kind of work in concert to help to keep us safe when it comes to that trauma, right? So we're usually trauma activates one small part of our brain, which is called the amygdala, which is like the, the oldest part of our brain that's existed. That's kept us alive since like, you know, we were at cavemen, right. Or cave people. And so that as soon as anything might be different, that becomes activated and that shuts down other centers of our brain, which makes it very hard for us to be able to access those tools that we were talking about before. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so one of the best things that we can do is recognize that what we're experiencing many times when we're experiencing this resistance to doing something for selfhood or for self-love or for self-care that our brains are associating pain, pain, distress, tolerance, pain, which is like distress tolerance is like, it doesn't feel good all the time to go to the gym and I'm sweaty and it's, I'm really pushing myself and it's hard and I'm grimacing and I'm making these faces. I never even knew that I could make, you know, and all this stuff, right. It's painful. Or, you know, we're going for a hike or we're doing our greatest summit or we're, you know, doing an ice bath or, you know, cold plunge or whatever it is. Like it's for a second, you know, there is a extreme amount of discomfort, but what happens and one of the reasons why those are so successful is because we take the brain from combining pain to traumatic pain, pain where there's a negative consequence and there's some sort of deconstruction or there's some sort of like negative, bad, you know, thing on the other side of the pain that it's combining that with the pain of distress tolerance, which is there actually is a, a gain to us on the other side of the pain, that trauma, that trauma center in our brain is actually combining those two together, which is why we have such a strong resistance to doing something that is good for us. And many times, you know, a lot of people, like I hear coaches say all the time, oh, it's because, you know, you're getting in your own way and whatever. I mean, if it were that, if it were that easy for it just to be a choice, like, it, it, you know, we would, we would all be better and both you and I would be out of a job. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's really so much deeper and so much more than that. 
And so the more that we place ourselves in just right measure into these environments where we can experience some sort of discomfort or distress tolerance, we're actually helping the brain to separate those things out. And we're teaching that there actually are opportunities for, and that makes it the routine. And that's why I always say practice, right? Mm -hmm. It's a practice. It's never a perfection and it's never a, a tool. It's a practice because the practice actually creates that sameness that our brain then accepts a lot easier than if we're just like, again, a tool, well, this is new. Our brain's automatically rejecting it, right? It makes it that much harder to implement. So, so I think from just a neuroplasticity standpoint, it's really important to realize that we must really acknowledge the fact that everything about us is very healthy. The fact that we have all of these things, all of these experiences, even the resistance that you're experiencing towards maybe self-love or self-acceptance or whatever it is, it's actually a sign of your health, right? Mm. And we can see it that way and be like, wow, even disease is a sign of health. A sign of unhealth, like the, the health, but not in the way we want to be. Is that what you mean? Right. So- yeah. So disease is really a sign of the fact that our body is letting us know that there is something going on. Mm. Right. And so we may not have noticed the signs, right. Because we weren't necessarily at that point where we were in tune with our physical bodies or our emotional bodies or our mental bodies. And again, that has a lot to do with living in the future, chasing expectations, feeling like we need to do something, being on the treadmill, keeping up with the Joneses, whatever All it might be, right? All of the distractions, right? Yeah. We, we abandon and dismiss ourselves all of the time. Right. And so, so what we, what we start to do is we start again, we get to start to deconstruct all of those things. We unlearn a lot of those things. And, but in the meanwhile, disease is like a seed that's planted at the origin point, right? So the seeds planted and it grows and some, sometimes the seeds don't grow. And sometimes the seeds do grow. Sometimes it grows into, you know, acid reflux, irritable bowel syndrome, Crohn's disease, autoimmune diseases, panic attacks, mental health issues, cancer, you know, all of that. Right. So that is actually a sign of health. That's a sign that our body is trying to do its job to isolate the thing and help to get it out. But because we become attached to, or we continue to repattern that abandonment or that, that commitment to living out of coherence, right. Or conflict with what the truth is of our world, as opposed to like, you know, what we want the truth to be, <laughs> right. Yeah. Then, right. then we continue to perpetuate that. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That, that makes total sense saying that it is health of trying and get your attention into the whispers that turn into screams a hundred percent. Now yeah. let's, let's get into trauma a bit more. You mentioned brain work, recursive therapy. therapy. Can you, yeah. Could you tell us more about that? Because I'm not sure I'm familiar with that. Yeah. Which I'm happy to hear that you're not familiar with it because that's one of the reasons why I chose one of these therapies because, you know, being a clinician and, and again, like doing somatic work prior to becoming a therapist and having all of these, these different things at our disposal, right. Part of just to share a little bit about myself, part of the reason why I do what I do is because I created what I needed for myself. So I experienced a lot of trauma in my life birth trauma, in the womb trauma, you know, lifespan, de lifespan development trauma, psychological torture, sexual abuse, medical abuse, religious abuse. I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on. Right. So I placed myself in front of many, many, many different practitioners, especially, you know, Western medicine, and they just didn't get it. They didn't understand really what was going on, kind of circling back to the whole like disease thing. Right. So Western medicine is really, and I talk about this in my book, but Western medicine is really designed to create a cure, right? And a cure is for the symptoms. So if I have migraines, it'll make the migraine go away. If I have, you know, reflux, it'll make the reflux hopefully go away, but it's not going to really get to the core or the root of like, why am I getting migraines? or why do I have reflux or whatever it is, right? So trauma really is 
at the root and at the seat of so many things that we experience in our lives. The lens that we see ourselves in the world, how we actually react and act in the world and so on and so forth. So I found brain working recursive therapy much later on in my healing journey. And I had already like, you know, for over 25 years have been doing, you know, major deep dive into healing for, for all and many of the things, right. And I've worked with shamans and I've worked with, you know, just lots and lots of, I've been very, very blessed in the people that I've just kind of tripped into (laughs) literally. And so when I started working with this one practitioner, she said, you know, this is a very, very new therapy. She found out about it by a friend who was also a practitioner who then did it with her who, you know, because they all both had experienced a lot of trauma and she said, I'd I'd like you to try it. And I said, I am so down for this because really like going back to the tools thing, I feel like I have so many tools. I need to rent a storage unit, right? Uh Like it's just like, I want to actually not have to use so many tools. Like I just know I had this knowing I had this pull to know that, you know, life could be so much more with ease, you know, Mm -hmm. and for me to be who I am really can come with much more ease. And so, so I actually received brain working recursive therapy and it was life-changing one of the, one of the life-changing things that I had received. And so I immediately said, I've got to, I've, I've got, I have to be able to pass this forward. And I have to be able to give this gift. So I was, you do have to be a therapist, I think, in order to to do this, or at least I, I, that was the criteria at the time. I don't know what the criteria is now, but it was created by a man named Terrence Watts, who is still alive. He's actually from London and he originally, he's a psychotherapist and he originally was, he did a lot of hypnotherapy. And then he just started, like, he has this very curious mind and he just kept studying all of these different things like the Labette system and all of these different things where there's actually this like time gap between impulse and response. And it's a fraction of a, it's, it's a fraction of a second sometimes, but if you can get in there, you can actually help to short circuit where the direction of the neural pathway is going and you can redirect it into something else and also heal the original place of where the trauma is. In the, but it's, it's, a, it's a full body experience. It's not just kind of all up in your head. And so he created it and he continued honing the skill. They actually started using it in South Africa at which it just like took off like crazy because it was so, so beneficial. And so it's actually very well known in Europe and across the world, but not as much in the United States, because again, it's, it's not as commoditized. It's not packaged in a certain way, you know? So I, I saw that and I said, great, because that means it's not tainted. It's not, you know, there's nothing, nobody owes anybody anything in this, right. Except for just the practitioners really want to help their clients to truly heal and be able to do things. So brain working recursive therapy can help with trauma, but it also can help with things like fear of success, or I I use it a lot with professional athletes, right? So we get to like improve performance and physical performance. And I actually did it on myself and because I was running and I was starting to feel heavy and my body was hurting a lot. And because I had a lot of miles on the road and, and, you know, my body was starting to break down. I was like, Oh, this is not good. So I actually did brain working recursive therapy on myself for running. And like my runs just got so much better and I improved my time and my distance and all of this stuff. So it's a phenomenal therapy and it's very fast and effective. And it's really nothing like anything that anybody else has experienced before. Yeah, that's super, super fascinating. The only thing that really comes up for me is like theta healing. It sounds Mm -hmm. a little similar to that based off of what you're describing, like what I can equate it to, but to walk us all through it a bit more, because this is something that I'm probably going to hit you up about afterwards and want a session because it sounds really awesome. What does it look like in terms of scheduling a session with you and how that kind of unfolds? 
Yeah. So again, it's really a very fast and effective therapy. And that's one of the reasons why it is as popular as it is, because it's extremely precise in its ability to really get down into the root. But it's also one of those things where it's it's counterintuitive to ther- clinical therapy because clinical th- therapy many times except for it's not what insurance doesn't tell us this, but what clinical therapy tells us is, you know, you kind of like go in, you sit down, you talk about your week, you talk about whatever, and you know, so on and so forth. So BWRT is one of those where we choose, you choose what it is that you, you know, maybe you want to work on, or you might just come, come and say, I don't really don't know what I want to work on, but I just know that I just don't, Feel. And depending upon the practitioner, I'm, I'm an intuitive. So I use all of my gifts to be able to just like get right in there and just ask the right questions, fire up the right emotions, get into the right neuropathway and away we go. So, so basically you schedule a session. There's like, I would say to, to do one, it takes like between one to three sessions, you know, some might market it only one session, but quite honestly, I think that there, there's something to be said to like where the person's at with regard to how much they intellectualize things, how much they cancel themselves out, how much they judge themselves, how much they're able to access emotions and all of that stuff. So I say one to three sessions just to, to be sure that we're really able to cover it. Absolutely. And okay. So that's something you do on zoom, I take it. Yeah. So I work with people globally and have again, been doing this for for years. And so even before the pandemic, we were doing this and, and that's how most people are experiencing this. I know in Europe they do, they started out face-to-face. So it tends to, to continue to drive, to be more face-to-face and especially in like England, but here it's, it's more, you know, it, for me, at least it's, it's more zoom. Yeah. And is it kind of like hypnosis then? Or are you kind of like putting them in a certain state or what's it like for the experience? It's not like hypnosis. I'm not a trained hypnotherapist. So I I've, I've done hypnosis once or twice and it's definitely not been like my experience. And it's really different each time that you experience it. But the best way that I can explain it is that let's just say, well, do you want to, do you want to share something like that comes off the top of your head? Like something, it doesn't have to be very personal, but just like, oh, I, I got something super personal that, and uh, I've shared some vulnerable stuff, but this isn't the one that I, I feel like no. sharing right now. So no, no, I, no past, but I have in the past and right now it's just not the time, but thank you. No, no, no. It's not. I'm just trying to come up with an example. So let's just say money blocks. That's a big one. Right. Okay. So money blocks. Right. So I don't know what it is, but I just, you know, I keep like, I work really hard for my money. And the next thing I know there's more month at the end of the money. And like, I have more bills than I have money and I feel like I just can't hold on to it. And I just never have enough and so on and so forth. So that's the kind of the originator. And that's what the potential block is. But really what we start to do this and then is investigate the emotions, right? So uh, based upon whatever that person's experience is and what they're presenting and what their landscape is, I'll start to ask some questions and we'll start to get into some of the emotions, right? So, well, okay. So how do you feel when you, can you even open up your, your bank account on your phone? right? Some people can't even open up the bank account. Like they won't even look, they won't look at their, their balance. They're afraid to, you know, do their books or whatever it is. Right. So we start with, Oh, okay. So what does it feel like when you actually open up your app on your phone? Right. Okay. Oh my God. I panic. I start to sweat, you know? And so we start to create a bank and a cluster of emotions that they're experiencing when it comes to money. Right. And then I walk them through some steps and then we then move on from that. And then we talk about, well, okay, so that is definitely your true experience. Yet at the same time, you know that that's not really who you are, right? Because you know that you're like this incredible human being that has so much to offer in the world and is ready to, you know, go out there and like, you know, ascend to the next level and serve more and, you know, there's just infinite pools of abundance that you have ready for you to call in. So how is it that you'd want to feel as you're receiving that abundance? 
right? And so maybe that person would say free or whatever it is. So we'd create a cluster of emotions and then we would talk about a memory that collectively embodies all of those emotions, right? So you could have been seven years old, having the time of your life, riding your bike down the road with your friends, sun was shining, you were flying down the road, you take your hands and your arms off the handlebars and the, and the pedals, and you just allow yourself to just fly, right? So that is the associated memory to what those emotions are of how you prefer to feel. And then I take you through kind of a series of exercises where we actually have to feel and experience the emotions. And so depending upon how each person experiences things and senses, I would, t- and that's where the in- intuitive piece comes in and not a- every practitioner does it this way, but you know, I would really tap into those how they feel it. How do they see colors? You know, do they smell something? Are they by the ocean? Do they smell the seawater coming in? Like, do they, you know, do they feel sweat beating down their face or whatever it might be? Right. And then we, we go through and we do loops and I get, and that's where we kind of, you know, short circuit things. Mm. So, so if we were to say that, like, your memory or your block is like the screen of a television, right? Mm -hmm. And when you plug the television into the outlet, the energy and electricity goes from the outlet and starts to course up through the wire. I'm able to cut off the energetic electrical circuit before it gets to the television screen. And then I'm able to rewire it and place it where it's actually meant to be. So maybe you want it on your computer screen, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm able to actually replace it where it's more in alignment, which is one of the reasons why it sticks. So we dig up all of the old stuff that doesn't belong there. That's unhealed trauma or wound. We dig it up, we excavate it, we replant new soil, we plant some new seeds, and then we allow it to grow. Nice. That's, that's incredible. Yeah. Thank you for walking us through the process. Cause I think that really helps to conceptualize it a bit more. So I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. In, in terms of trauma, you mentioned that trauma is one of your favorite topics. What are some things yeah. that come up for you or that you really are passionate about that you think people ought to know around trauma? Well, I think that trauma, I think that we need to be open to the fact that our understanding of trauma and how it shows itself in our world and in our own personal lives, as well as collectively, is a lot bigger and greater than we ever thought it to be. And I think that and always is the best of intentioned, right? So I think that everybody wants to help someone else. But one of the things that was my own personal journey on both sides as somebody who was receiving help or, and also somebody who was providing help is that we really need to understand where we're able to help someone and then where it might be better for us to hand it off to somebody who is better equipped to actually help that person heal. Many times what we do when we hear a story and I'm sure you might've done this at one point in our, in our conversation. I know I do it all the time. It's a very human thing to do. Someone shares a story about their life, right? So maybe I was talking about, you know, riding your bike on the road with your friends and the sun beating down, and you probably could picture yourself doing that. Right. Mm -hmm. So Now, if you were sharing that story of you riding your bike, I'd be like, Oh my God. Yeah. I used to do that with my friends too. Right. Mm -hmm. So when we're talking about trauma, many times people will say, oh yeah, for instance, for me, I am a survivor of narcissistic and sociopathic abuse, right? So somebody might say, oh, well, how did that happen? What happened? You know, and almost asking to share the story to prove that they actually are a survivor of narcissistic and sociopathic abuse, right? And so that retelling of the story just in and of itself, depending upon where the person is at, could be very traumatizing, right? The environment where we're being asked to share the story, even though we, they, the person might feel very comfortable to share, to share the story, might be traumatizing. It's not the right place, right? Or maybe the person does share the story, it's the right environment, and then 
you say, oh God, yeah, that happened to me too, but I got over it. I read this book and now I'm fine. And now look at me, I'm doing great. Right. So for someone who's experienced that and hasn't necessarily healed that, that could really be very traumatizing in and of itself. I also think that there are programs that are designed that are out there that are meant to help people to heal, but they really haven't created the proper onboarding and offboarding. So I know we, we've talked about one of our passion projects, which is, you know, plant medicine, right? And I, I never, I was never called to that personally. However, many people who were called to that show up to me needing help. And one of the reasons why is because they didn't have the proper expectation for what the experience was going to be like and maybe how hard it was going to be. And also maybe had some ab reactions to the environment and then really didn't have the proper support or didn't blind themselves up with the proper support afterwards. And that can be really traumatizing. The other thing too, is that we have to understand that from a clinical perspective, people who have experienced trauma build a lot of tools, right? So there's something called normalizing, right? So My whole life, I spent a lot of bandwidth trying to normalize myself, right? Trying to to not be gifted, trying to not be different, trying to not have all of these like neuro superpowers and all of these other things, right? And so what happens when we normalize ourselves, I place myself in front of you. You're like, oh yeah, she's, you know, she's this way, right? Because I'm trying really hard to be that way. But what's underneath there one layer or 10 layers deep are a lot of tools that I use to survive my trauma all of my life that have now become part of maybe some personality traits that can be a little tricky, right? And I'm not at all trying to make anybody who's experienced trauma into like a bad person or that they're wounded or broken because I don't think anybody's broken. However, I think we have to really understand a 360 view of trauma and also people who have experienced trauma and how that might show up and present itself so that we can really provide the right environment and the right tools and the right practitioners for the right job. And so it's not a this way or that way. It's a multi-spectrum approach to like understanding that there could be you know, a little bit of experience or effect, or there could be like, a I don't even know, like an avalanche of things that we're really dealing with, with the individual. And it's just important to have integrity and to have, you know, to, to take pause and really ask yourself, what are you opening up here? And why are you opening it, opening it up? That's a good one. Once I, I just had that conversation with someone this morning about plant medicine, actually, and you know they are new into it and have had a few really wonderful experiences, and you know they're vibrating high, and they're asking how can I maintain this, and then talking about going back to the medicine, and that mm-hmm. is something that I have mixed feelings about because in one regard. Um, it can be very helpful to kind of like think of it as like a routine check check in with the doctor. And that's what it is. The plants are doctors, right. And going back, but the same token to your point about the people coming to you, not really fully realizing what they're getting into. It's like, okay, you had that experience this time, but know that anytime you open up that door, you're welcoming a a dark night of the soul. So please do not expect that again. So I think that's really important that you brought that up. And I actually wanted to ask you a different question. That's just kind of what came up right now, trying to remember what it was now. I lost it, but it was around trauma, obviously, because that's what we're talking about. (laughs) Oh, I I remember it's holding space for others and projecting Mm -hmm. and things like that. In your, what you're talking about, you mentioned the example of like someone else and being like, oh, I had that too, but 
hey, I'm good now, right? And as the world becomes more vulnerable, as we really start to dive in firsthand in terms of addressing our mental well-being, more and more people are doing the work and they might not realize the power of their words and their communication mm-hmm. and their energetic hygiene and things like this. So I would love to hear from you how to hold space safely. Oh my gosh. You just like shared some like very nuanced, very important things, right? So energetic and personal hygiene, spiritual hygiene, that's huge. Mm -hmm. I think that that's so important. So holding space for someone, again, it's always setting that intention. So for instance, like, you know, you could be a yoga instructor, right? And we all know that when we go into, at least for me, When I go to do yoga, I know there is a possibility that I'm going to have an emotional release because we store a lot of our emotional experiences in our physical body and in our energetic body. So when we move, you know, movement moves energy, right? And so when we get into the the scientific part, like we get into the fascia, the fascia holds the memory of experience and it holds emotion physically holds emotion, right? Our lymphatic system and all of this other stuff, right? So a yoga instructor has to be prepared on some level to know that one of their students might have an emotional release, right? And so they are totally prepared and totally the authority to go over if, and ask, would you like me, how would you like me to support you right now? Right? I see you. Or maybe they know that person well enough to know, like, they're fine. But if it continues, I'm going to go over. Right. But many times what happens or sometimes what happens is that sometimes the instructor might pull the student aside at the end of class and just say, what was going on? What was your experience? What were you thinking about? What was the release about? And then they start to dig and probe and try and get into it. And that is not a good way of holding space for someone Mm -hmm. (laughs) because a yoga instructor, unless they're also a licensed therapist, you know, or a healer or a practiced coach that's there and designed to be there on the other end of when somebody has that traumatic expression or release that they, they, this, this person may not be the right person to help to unpack that and to really process that effectively so that there's a healing on the other side. Right. So, so again, environment and space holding is so important because we have to realize that there is the potential that no matter where you go, so it can be a retreat, it can be a plant ceremony. It can be, it can be a mastermind. It can be, you know, a men's group. It can be a woman's group. It can be sometimes just bringing all that energy together is enough to pop something up for someone. Right. And so if we're the one who is asking energetically for people to come and commune, We have to be mindful and aware of the fact that these are all great potentialities. We are on the tail end of a very, very sensitive time. And we are on the beginning end of a very, very huge trajectory of change, right? So for us to be prepared as practitioners and as space holders for all of these different potentialities and realize, okay, here's where I am now. Here's how far I've gone in my own healing. Here's how educated I am and experienced I am with working with other people and getting feedback on that. So this is where I know I'm very comfortable being able to execute. Here is where I'm not. And I know that there's the potential for that to happen. So let me just find some people out in the field who I trust with my people, who I really want, who I love, right? And so that I make sure that everybody has everything that they need. I think that there is this feeling of pressure because again, that conversation that we had in the beginning about always feeling like we need to justify our existence, right? And so we have this pressure to feel like we need to be everything to everyone all the time. And actually one of the best things that we can say is, you know what? 
I know you're really having a hard time right now and I'm comfortable sitting with you while you're having the hard time. And if you want to really go a little deeper with that, you know, I've my friend Sam over here and like he, I've seen him work with so many people and help them to the other side. Like I would love to introduce you, right? That's a really, really good, effective space holding for someone. Yeah. Thank you for that. And I think a lot of times we don't ask for permission. We just go. Mm -hmm. Right. And one thing that came up for, which by the way, I actually, I don't know if you know this, but I am a yoga instructor and I, I teach yoga once a week, partially because of that. Right. It's a lot of energy for me and to hold whatnot. Mm -hmm. And yesterday is my scheduled class and I was going through it and I needed mm -hmm. to have a mental health day. So I, I couldn't show up. So I had asked for a sub and I was able to get a sub luckily because, uh, you know, that's the last thing you want to do, just power through it. I mean, you want to make sure that your cup is full first, just in general, but especially in doing okay. this type of work. So this morning in journaling, one of the things that came up for me, I also facilitate men's groups was and I'm very big on setting a safe container and going over the shares and the different type of shares and, and that type of stuff so that we are using, you know, nonviolent communication, mindful communication, mm. all the things that we're alluding to. But what came up for me in journaling was like, how can I apply how I approach my sharing circles to my everyday conversations? Because that's mm -hmm. part of what happened yesterday was like, even though I've been very good in since quote unquote doing the work these past few years of utilizing the tool, tool, practice, whatever that yeah. I need in that moment, I was tested yesterday with the biggest moment probably of the past few years or one of, and I wouldn't say I failed, but you know, I could have done better. There's always room for improvement. And upon yeah. reflection, really what came to me was like, okay, I was like utilizing those, the style of shares that we use and doing my best to at like really li listen, seeking to understand as opposed to like just project and all this type of stuff, but I can do better. And, and, and there's room for improvement. And it's like you said, all of this is a practice. So rather than being like, Oh, I'm in my women's or men's or, you know, non-binary, whatever your circle, your sharing circle, and now we're doing things and then life happens. And then, Oh, you know what you should do? You know, you're talking about buddy just casually. It's like in those casual conversations, like we need to apply these things as well. So. Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And I love the fact, gosh, you just even went up another notch, Sam. I didn't know it was possible. So <laughs> you like just the fact that you knew like, gosh, I'm really going through it right now. And there's nothing wrong with going through it. First of all, I go through it. Everybody goes through it. And that's, I call that like karma working its way through, right? Like the lessons need to work its way through. And it's a visceral you know, triphasic way. It's not like we, we go through it a little bit. Okay. I'm just going to stick it in the back corner of my mind. No, like sometimes we are literally like physically unable to show up and you are, it's so important to realize that, that your daily practice is what allows you to be able to go and hold space in the way that you hold space for people. And so that you, you make that association and you said, I've got to get a sub to hold this class. Now you could have gone and you could have gone through the motions and you would have abandoned what your needs were in that moment. And you probably wouldn't have been as great for the individuals, right? And potentially some of that karma that you were working through would have worked its way out in that environment. And, and, and that's not really holding the best of integrity, right? Like I've had moments where I was, I, I received some really bad news prior to a session and I was really upset. And so I, I, I turned on the session. I just said, listen, I know this is very last minute, but I just re received some really bad news and I'm really upset. And I don't think it would be fair to you for me to have a session with you right now. Could I do it? Yeah. Would I be a hundred percent present? No. So I care about you. I care about being present for you. So I think that's most important. 
Yeah. Anything. And we need to find ways to be real with and with one another. As you mentioned earlier about like no mass with you, right? Like (laughs) I'd like to feel the same about me. And like, there are times for sure where we show up with these masks. And I mean, all of this work is about doing our best to remove the layers of conditioning, let go of the armor and remove the mask. But yeah, we, part of the practice too, is realizing when that comes back, you know, and having that awareness, all of this is around a awareness. And just hearing you share that, it reminded me too, actually about a month ago, a similar thing happened right before teaching yoga. And I was conflicted. And this goes back to what we talked about earlier, like the discernment between pain and discomfort and things like that. And I looked at it as an opportunity to lean in and get uncomfortable and still teach because it was a different style thing where it wasn't so much like yesterday I was in pain. It was more like I was having existential angst, like really, really big stuff and like feeling the darkness very mm-hmm. strong and it terrifying in a way. But at the same time, like looking at this as an opportunity to share and grow the way I teach yoga is very different than most people. Cause it, it is like my message. I it's not as much like the Sanskrit and yogic actual philosophy. It's more like my own spirituality. And I lead that with being vulnerable of what's going on. Not that other teachers don't, but you know, like showing all the cards and, and sharing with them that, and mm-hmm. I was able to transmute all of that and mm-hmm. even just like be vulnerable with them. Like, Hey, we're doing this together. Like there is no guru, right? You are your own guru. You are your own best teacher. I'm yeah. here just holding space. That's literally what I'll say. So no, that's awesome. Here, let's, let's start to wrap this up. You have a book that was just released the week of this re- the, the time of this podcast being released because this yeah. podcast was recorded in advance. Tell us about the, the healer's journey. Yeah. So thank you so much. I'm so excited about this book. I can't wait for you and your listeners and our communities to read this. So this book is a memoir of some of my experiences. It's, it's written very much like a parable. There are many parables within it. But it's to awaken the healer in you. Mm. It's really to awaken the healer in everyone. And I take a lot of my own personal experiences and I share them so that we can understand the spiritual aspect. We can understand the gifted aspect. And when I say gifted, I mean like having access to all of the different, you know, psychic and, you know, mediumships and all of that stuff. Right. And and also the very scientific aspects and clinical aspects of when we move through life in this way, we many times find ourselves in these types of situations, right? So like you talked about a dark night of the soul or a spiritual awakening or whatever that, you know, might show up for and however that might show up for somebody else. So I, I really then take a lot of our concepts, even when it talks, when we're talking about spiritual awakening and I take it that next step further from where my visions are taking me for us to understand what those awakenings are for, right? Because I do believe that we are, we are all collectively as well as individually going through or have gone through many spiritual awakenings. But I believe that those awakenings are to awaken ourselves to something that is deeper and bigger and greater, which is that healing. Right. So, so I'm, I'm super, super excited for everyone to be able to read this. And so far the feedback that I've gotten went from people who have read like chapters is that they feel so seen and they feel so held and they feel so not alone. And so it touches on things like narcissistic and sociopathic abuse. It touches on lifespan development and, and, you know, psychological torture and that kind of stuff, but in a way where you're seeing things through my eyes. And so you're seeing my experiences and you can see yourself in that too. Mm, That's beautiful. I can't wait to read it. I'm going to grab my copy as it's out this week. So guys, show notes, you can find all the links to connect with Sharon, her Instagram, her website, and especially 
her book, The Healer's Journey. Sharon, thank you so much for coming on the Soul Seeker podcast. I appreciate you so much how you show up in the world. And thank you for sharing your wisdom with us here. Thank you so much for having me. It was so great. 